Hi, it's me, the Aquarius for fun. Are you planning to start using CO2 in your planted tanks? Well, let me give you guys a comprehensive run through when it comes to CO2. Okay, so first topic, why do you need CO2 in your tanks? When it comes to essential nutrients, the first thing that most aquarists or aquascapers will say are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Sometimes they might include magnesium as well but they usually forget about carbon. Remember, all living things in this planet are carbon-based life forms. We are primarily made of carbon and then some. Of course, the same thing applies for plants. Carbon is the main building block for their growth, and that carbon is commonly available through the gas called carbon dioxide or CO2. Okay, okay, I can hear you asking. Well, if CO2 is this important, how come low-tech aquascapes can exist without CO2 injection. Well, low-tech setups, they are usually heavily reliant on plant selection. Most non-CO2 setups, they are heavily reliant on easy category plants. Most of those easy category plants are non-CO2 reliant or they may get their carbon on other carbon sources like carbonates and existing bicarbonates. And some plants, they don't rely on CO2 as their main carbon source. What? Well, yeah, plants like Cryptocrynes, Velisnerius, Ceratophyllums like foxtails and hornworts, these plants use or primarily prefer other sources of carbon like carbonates. Other easy category plants like Anubias, they're really slow growing. So their carbon requirement isn't as heavy to something as compared to other plants. And if you're gonna ask me, objectively speaking, no matter how minute the difference can be, plants of the same species will always be better in a well-maintained CO2-injected aquascape compared to a non-CO2 well-maintained aquarium. It's either they are more compact, less leggy, some have even improved coloration, and some plants will form a denser carpet compared to a non-CO2 tank. Now that I've given you a basic understanding of why CO2 can be beneficial in your planted tanks or aquarium, let's go through what is probably the longest topic when it comes to CO2. What type of CO2 system will you be using? Well, there's basically two schools of thought. There's DIY versus pressurized CO2. Let us first start with the DIY CO2 system. How do we produce CO2? Well, there's the use of fungi and chemical reaction. Let's start with yeast. Yes, yeast is a form of fungi. So, so yeast, they kind of like sugars. And when these single-celled organisms start to consume and process sugars like glucose, fructose, sucrose, etc., they then turn those sugar into energy and then produce CO2. That process is called Fermentation. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Do I personally like to use it? No. I'll tell you guys later. The next process of CO2 production is through chemical reaction. Now, to give you guys a heads up, I used to compete in academic contests back in high school. I competed in chemistry, biochemistry, slash and or organic chemistry. So this topic is kind of interesting. We usually use citric acid in a form of carbonate usually sodium bicarbonate, aka baking soda. Since this is a chemical reaction, we can actually predict how much CO2 will be produced depending on how much materials you use by balancing equations. Okay, so how will you know how much citric acid is in say 100 grams? If everything is ideal, we can convert molecular weights into mass. Now, the reaction that happens inside this DIY CO2 generator is essentially an acid-based reaction. Citric acid being the acid and sodium bicarbonate or baking soda being the base. Usually, acid-based reactions will produce CO2, H2O, and some form of salts. C6H8O7 is citric acid and NaHCO3 is sodium bicarbonate. Now, to get the most out of your DIY CO2 setups, we can actually compute the most ideal ratio of citric acid and sodium bicarbonate when it comes to CO2 production. 
I'm gonna skip this part because it can be a bit complicated. Okay, so the ideal ratio is for every one gram of citric acid, you need to use 1.3 grams of baking soda or sodium bicarbonate. This ratio will give you the maximum amount of CO2. I'm just gonna flash the equation real quick. Any of you can cross check me if you want. Okay, so for example, a small CO2 generator like this will be able to handle say 100 grams of citric acid. How much baking soda will I use? Around 130, 131 grams. This in turn will generate 1.56 moles of CO2. Or if you want to like convert it into like mass, it's gonna be 1.56 1, 1. times 44. I'm gonna need a calculator. <laughs> okay, so 1.56 times 44 is 68 grams. So that's 68 grams of CO2 for every 100 grams of citric acid and 131 grams of baking soda. That's abysmally low. <laughs> well, that's the exact science of it. CO2 is not magically produced. And we've already made some rough calculations in order to predict how much CO2 you'll be getting from one mix. And it's really low. I hope I didn't crush your spirits. So if you're gonna ask me, do I personally use it? No. So that's the DIY side of things. Let us now go to the industry standard, which is the use of pressurized CO2. Now, unlike the DIY where you have to produce the CO2 yourself, pressurized CO2 systems, you'll get pure CO2, nothing else. If they say it's two kilograms of CO2, then most probably it's gonna be two kilograms of CO2. You don't have to wait for microorganisms to eat and shit CO2 for you. You don't have to rely on the randomness for molecules to actually collide and form a very low amount of CO2. No, you'll get plain, unadulterated, pure CO2. What are the pros and cons? So, what is the benefit of using, say, a DIY CO2 setup? Well, they are actually the cheapest method to start a CO2 system in your planted tanks. Big emphasis on the start. They are also less intimidating for beginners. And that's it. Those are the ones that I can think of. Pressurized CO2 on the other hand, they last longer, they are consistent, they are accurate, they are reliable, and you don't have to fiddle with it every few days or so. They are cheaper to use in the long run, and you also get a good amount of pressure, which means you can use different ways or methods to deliver CO2 into your tank. More on that later. Now, the bad side of using DIYs. DIY CO2 is very unreliable, inconsistent, you have to constantly monitor the thing just to make sure you have enough pressure to run your CO2 setup. And you are very limited in the ways you can deliver CO2 in your system. They are also more expensive to run in the long term. If you want to see a price comparison, I did it on this video. For pressurized CO2s, pressurized CO2 setups, can be very intimidating for beginners. It's kinda expensive initially, and if you're super, super, super clumsy, or careless, or just plain stupid, it can be very dangerous to handle pressurized tanks. Next topic is methods of delivery. Let's first talk about passive delivery. Passive CO2 delivery is where you will use a dome or a bell in order to hold the CO2 in. And then what do you do with it? You just passively wait for it to be absorbed or dissolved in the water. It's a great method for those who have a low-tech setup but still wants to have the benefits of having CO2 in their aquascapes. Another method of delivery is through an in-tank diffuser. This is what I would say is the most common method of delivery. Now, in order for this diffusers to work properly, you should have a well thought of aquarium circulation in order to distribute the CO2 bubbles and as much as possible prevent those CO2 bubbles from reaching the surface. 
So with this type of CO2 delivery, placement is key. Where would I place it? Well, usually it is placed on the opposite side of your outflow lily pipe. What are the downsides of using an in-tank diffuser? You'd have to have a decent product to start with. The finer the bubbles, the better. These type of diffusers are very dependent on proper and consistent water circulation. Another downside of using an in-tank diffuser is that you cannot actually use it on very large tanks. Personally, I'd say 60 centimeters is already at the limit of what's optimal. 90 centimeters is just really pushing it. Now, one step above in-tank diffusers is an in-line diffuser. It's essentially the same thing, but instead of diffusing the CO2 bubbles inside your tank, it would then instead diffuse CO2 bubbles in line or along the pipes of your external canister filters. And kinda like in-tank diffusers, the in-line diffusers efficiency is highly affected by water circulation. What makes it better than in-tank diffusers? Well, with inline diffusers, you won't have to think about the proper placement. It is also aesthetically more simple or pleasing compared to in-tank diffusers. And you can also use inline diffusers on large aquariums. So, what are the downsides of an inline diffuser? Well, I've mentioned it earlier, you kinda need an external canister filter in order to use an inline diffuser. Hang on back filters, in tank filtration systems, and pumps, they won't work. Another downside of using an inline diffuser is the amount of CO2 mist that it will produce inside your tank. The sheer amount of misty, tiny CO2 bubbles inside your tank would make it look like as if you have Sprite or 7up. Those tiny CO2 bubbles can be a bit distracting and can ruin your photo or video. So we finally reach what is probably the last form of CO2 delivery, which is an inline reactor. So just like inline diffusers, an inline reactor is also placed along the tubes or along the pipes of your external canister filter. So what these inline reactors have it going for themselves is that with inline reactors, it is possible to reach a 100% dissolution rate, meaning all CO2 that you've injected is actually dissolved into water. No more misty CO2 bubbles ruining your photo or videos. Now, the downsides of using an inline reactor, just like an inline diffuser is that you'd actually need an external canister filters. Hang on back filters, in-tank filtration systems or pumps, they won't work. Speaking of external canister filters, you definitely need a strong one. Why? Because it can actually lower or slow down your filtration rate. Another downside is that it does not have those misty CO2 bubbles. I know, it's a bit confusing. Those misty CO2 bubbles are actually kind of beneficial for your plants. Why? Because they are more readily available for plants to use. Which of those CO2 delivery methods do I personally use? I actually use inline diffusers for all of my CO2 injected aquascapes or aquariums. Now, another topic about CO2 systems is assembly. I've already kind of talked about this in this video, but since this is a comprehensive guide, let's talk about it again. So, you have your source of CO2, which in this case is a pressurized tank. You'd also need a gauge or. Oh, fuck. Or. Or plain stupid. You'd actually need a gauge or a regulator, ideally with the solenoid on. You'd need a bubble counter, a CO2 resistant tubing, a one way valve, and your actual method of delivery. So, going back, assembly is basically or essentially the same when it comes to DIY systems. Okay, so. You might have a question, what is a solenoid valve and what do they actually do? Well, it's a device you use if you want to, and you should, automate the delivery of your CO2. So you should connect your solenoid valves to a timer, which can either be a mechanical timer or a fancy smart timer that you can connect to your phone. So if it's connected to a timer, then you can set up when the CO2 turns off or when you want your CO2 to turn on. Which then leads me to the next topic, timing. 
How long should I run my CO2? Well, the correct answer is it depends. Depends on what? Do you have a hard water or a soft water? How long do you usually run your lights for? There is actually no golden rule on how long you should be running your CO2. But here's my advice. I have hard water and I start my CO2 two hours before the light turns on. If you have like soft water, then you can get away with your CO2 running an hour before your lights turn on. And I usually just end it whenever your lights turn off. Now, I hear you asking, why do I have to turn on my CO2 before the lights turn on? Well, this is so you can have like optimal amounts of CO2 inside your tank when photosynthesis starts. Next topic is, how will I measure CO2 in my aquarium? This video is too long. So this is a regular CO2 indicator. What you usually do is put this indicator solution inside this beautiful glasswares and wait for the color to change. Initially, the indicator liquid is blue. The ideal level should be green. And when you're reaching high CO2 levels, it'll turn into yellow. Is it accurate? No, not really. Results are actually delayed because it takes time for the indicator fluid to change its color. Well, if that isn't accurate, then what is? There's the pH KH test. So what you'll need is a proper testing kit for it. Day one is where you'd want to do your baseline measurements and you have to measure them two hours before your lights and CO2 turn on. So after you've measured your baseline KH, you can use this lookup table. You should try and look it up on the table where your ideal levels or pH or CO2 levels are. 30 to 40 ppm of CO2 is what we are all aiming for. Okay, so here's the thing. You should do your measurements every two hours and start doing your measurements before your lights and CO2 turn on. Do it every two hours until your lights turn off. So if you've only just recently started and wanted to use this method in order to like measure how much your tank needs or how many bubbles per second your tank needs, you'll need to start with one bubbles per second. If you have like a nano aquarium, say maybe 10 gallons and below, you should start with one bubble every three to four seconds. If you cannot lower your pH by one, then on the following day, you'll need to increase your CO2. Adjust it to like two bubbles per second and then do the entire routine all over again. That's basically it. Just remember, CO2 is not a magic cure for everything. Okay, so I hope I've answered most if not all of your questions about CO2 systems in this comprehensive guide. I tried to make what I believe is a true comprehensive guide when it comes to CO2 systems in your aquascapes or just plain planted aquariums. So if you found this video helpful, then I suggest you to subscribe, leave this video with a thumbs up because in this channel, I talk about aquascaping, fish skipping, and a bunch of tips and guides on how to be a better aquarist. So that's it for me. Bye.